It is good to be with you guys this morning. How many are excited that it is not snowing yet? <clears throat> Yesterday I was uh, driving around the state a little bit. I was going down doing some hunting and I was just seeing how the Lord just painting the tops of the trees. I love this time of year. I absolutely love it. Well, it's good to be here this morning, and for those joining online, we just want to say welcome and thanks. I know that there are many who watch every week, and so when we say welcome, I'm not just talking to the air, I'm not just talking to the screen, but I'm thinking of Larry and Sue and Jim and Helen and Laura and Ray and Carolyn and Dora Lee and Ken and Donna and Dean and Mary and John and Susan and Fran and so many more. And if I didn't say your name, don't be offended, but we welcome you, we love you, and even though you can't be here, you're still very much a part of this family. We care about you. We are starting a new four-week series with the title, Fear Not. Turn to your neighbor and say, Fear Not. If you have received the Spirit of God inside you, you have been saved, you've, you've received the Spirit of God, you do not have to feel afraid. Scripture says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you have the Spirit of God, you do not have to be afraid. But when we look around the world, we listen to the news, we examine society, how many know it's easy to let fear slip in and grip your heart? Billions of dollars are spent every day to ease our fears. We spend money on security systems and cameras to make sure our homes are safe. We buy insurance and extended warranties just in case something goes wrong. I'm even embarrassed to say this morning that a couple weeks ago when Hurricane Helen was blowing through, I went out of fear and bought two big rolls of toilet paper. Anybody else do the same thing? <laughs> I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm a part of the problem. <laughs> World leaders can manipulate people through fear. Fear has been used to start wars. Hitler used many fear-based statements to get people to follow his evil plans, and many people were committing those atrocities believing that they were actually doing the right thing. It was for a good cause. Unfortunately, pastors have used fear to gain and manipulate a response. Maybe you grew up hearing a gospel message that was presented with fear as being the main reason as why to turn to Christ. And, and to, preaching was fire and brimstone, but today it, it seems that things have swung maybe to the other side of the pendulum and, and we don't hear enough about the wrath of God. Can I just say that the gospel should be a balance of the love of God and God's judgment and wrath? It's a, it's a balance. Fear is generally seen in this negative emotion, and in a negative light. However, how many know that there are healthy fears, right? The fears of fruits and vegetables are not a healthy fear, okay? <laughs> um, if I were hiking or you were hiking and on the edge of this trail, there was a steep drop off, a sheer drop off and there were rocks, a healthy fear would be hugging the inside of that trail and proceeding with caution. I talked to my children, I've got three kids, before you go and run after the tennis ball or whatever it is that went into the street, look both ways, look a few times, right? Those are examples of healthy fears in our lives. Now, why the title of our series is Fear Not, Scripture gives us clear instructions of what we should and what we should not fear. And for those who brought their Bible, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 10? We're going to be looking at many scriptures, but the main scripture that I would ask that everyone here would really take to heart, that you would remember, is found in verse 28. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he sends them out to the lost sheep of Israel to cast out impure spirits, to heal every sickness and disease. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says to his disciples, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Fear not, right? Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear not man, fear God. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that in this short amount of time that you would help me 
to preach exactly what you want said in this service, I pray that my heart would continually be open to what you're speaking. I thank you that you have started a work in me this week in preparing this word, and I pray that same work would continue and walk itself out in fear and trembling, and I pray for everyone else here that we would hear you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At the end of today's service, I'm going to give the opportunity for the Lord to speak to our hearts about any fears that we carry that we need to surrender to him. In a world where many people live in fear, today is a call to return to the only condoned and commanded fear in Scripture, and that is the holy fear of God. I'm concerned that the church as a whole has lost the fear of the Lord. And before you go amening, allow the Spirit of God to check your heart just as he has checked my heart. We sang this morning, and I love this song, The Goodness of God, right? Why, why do I love that so much? Because he has been faithful, and he is so good. But I've thought a lot this week about that second verse that we sang. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. Man, we seem to love to sing about the friendship of God. And in many ways, it's this beautiful image, right? Like being a friend of God. But I'm concerned that friendship with the Lord has been oversimplified. It sometimes feels that people talk about friendship with the Lord as if when they get to heaven, they're just gonna run up and jump in the Lord's lap or lean on his shoulder or grab his hand or, or dap him up and give him a bro hug. I don't know that it's that simple. There are only a handful of people that are described as being God's friends in Scripture, Moses being one of them. And in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses encounters God through the burning bush, Scripture paints this picture. When the Lord, verse 4 of Exodus 3, when the Lord saw that he, Moses, had gone over to look at this bush where the, the Lord was in, right, and to over to look, God called to Moses from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Can you just imagine that voice like, Moses, you know, like, I'm going to be so disappointed if I get up to heaven and God's like, Moses, you know, like, it's just, just not going to, it's not, not going to happen. Moses, Moses, you know, and Moses said, here I am, or it could be like, uh, what's the the guy that uh, plays God in uh, Bruce Almighty? Morgan Freeman, you know, I think of his voice, you know, sometimes when he, anyway, Moses said, I'm sorry, that was really bad. And Moses said, here I am. And, and God says this to his friend. He says this, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. God considered Moses his friend, yet Moses had this immense amount of fear and reverence for the Lord. Many have assumed that because we are saved that we are friends with God. He can be our friend, but just because you're a Christian, it doesn't mean that you're his friend. That might mess with some of your theology and understanding this morning because we've sung many songs about friendship with the Lord. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. But Jesus told his 12 disciples this in John chapter 15, verse 14. He says this, you are my friends if, if you do what I command. Are you quick, quick? To claim Jesus as your friend, but you still haven't done what he's asked you to do. Friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who live with the holy fear of God. Holy fear is not demonstrated by wearing a suit on Sunday morning. Holy fear is demonstrated by obeying the holy word of God. I want to answer two questions. I'm going to do so as fastly as I can this morning, quickly as I can, and then leave time for us to hear God. And the first question is this, what does it look like to fear God? What does it look like to fear God? First off, fearing God is not being afraid of him. I grew up in the day and age where spanking was the norm. Raise your hand if you were spanked as a child. Hey, look, we made it. It's great. How it worked in my house is my dad would tell me why I was going to be spanked, and then he would spank me, and then usually it would end up in him crying. 
this hurts me more than it hurts you. You don't even know. Anybody else have that experience or just my child? Oh, a couple. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you understand it. As a child, though, I, I remember, all right, never once did I question my dad's love for me. I, I didn't doubt that my dad loved me, but when he took that belt off and was like, top, 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 you know what I'm talking about? It's been a long time since I've heard that. Top, 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 top. And I knew I was going to get spanked. I feared him. And, and you, you can fear the punishment of someone who loves you and that you love them. Fear and love, they feel at odds with each other, but they don't have to be. God loves you so much, and he doesn't want to punish you or send you to hell. That's why he sent Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would put their trust, whoever believes, trust in obedience, in obedience, whoever would put their trust in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. He wants to forgive you. He doesn't want to punish you. That's why he's patient in his return. Second Peter 3 verse 9 says that the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise in returning, this some people people think. No, he is being patient for who? For your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. If you came today and you feel like God is just waiting to judge you and he wants to punish you for all your sins, can I just tell you that that's not his heart? He doesn't want to do that. That's not, he's not just waiting in heaven just to give us what we deserve. Instead, God shows to us our sins and our shortcomings, why? So that we might repent and we might be cleansed and purified and he can forgive us. There is mercy for your past, but there is a grace for your tomorrow. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve for what we've done. Grace is giving us something we don't deserve which is the power to overcome sin, which is glorification when we're eventually saved from even the presence of sin. Right? There is. So what does it look like to fear God? I've, I've tried to come up with a definition that is short and concise. And in one sentence, this is the best I've got. To fear God is to take God and uh, his word seriously. To fear God is to take God and his word seriously. Everything he says, we do. To fear God is to esteem him, to respect, to honor and value, to adore him above anyone or anything else. To fear God is to abide by his holy book. Not verbally agree with it, not just a minute, but to actually obey it. I believe that one of the reasons why we have lost the fear of the Lord is because his judgment is delayed. In Acts chapter 5, we read about a married couple, Ananias and Sapphira. You can read there this afternoon who wanted to appear more holy and righteous than they actually were. And, and they, they sold some land and, and had given a portion of the money to the early church, but they lied and said that they had given it all. And they lied to the Holy Spirit. And, and God struck both Ananias and Sapphira dead on the spot for lying to the Holy Spirit. And in both verse 5 and verse 11, it says that great fear seized all who heard about these events. Can you imagine if God started judging us instantly for our sins? Whew! Thank you, God, that that's not his heart. That, that he's slow and he's patient with us. I, I think we'd have a complete different understanding and fear and respect of the Lord than we do right now. Do not be deceived into thinking that just because God doesn't want to punish you that he won't. Hear me, church. Delayed judgment is not denied judgment. There is coming a day where every man will stand before God and give account for what we have said, what we have done, and even what we've thought. Yes, our thoughts will be on trial. I'll tell you, I've gotten really good at not committing the sin, but I'm still a work in progress when it comes to my thoughts. I'm still, I'm still ironing some things out with the Lord when it comes to the motives behind things. Just a quick teaching moment. There's two judgments that will happen. One, every person, every person is going to go to the great white throne. This is, are you a saint or are you ain't? Are you in or are you not? Jesus is gonna open up the book of life. If your name's in it, you get to go to heaven forever, right? And, and those who not, he casts into the eternal lake of fire. Hell is a real place. 
There are real people, your friends, your loved ones. Maybe even you. And I'm not saying that to scare you, but but we ought to hear from the Lord, right? Everybody will go to the great white throne. Those who make it into heaven will have another judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where he, and you can read about that in Revelation 20. The judgment seat of Christ is in Romans 14 and 2 Corinthians 5. and, And that's where we will give account for everything we've said, done, and thought and we'll be rewarded for that. Heaven's not gonna just be this socialistic thing where we just go in. There's actually going to be like seats of honor and not seats of honor in heaven. That's not why we do stuff, but it is a little bit of motivation, right? Those days are coming. It's not a matter of if they happen. They're clearly described in the word of God and the word of God has been proven to be true. It is true and it forever will be true. Those days are coming, so we better take God's word seriously. What does it look like to fear God? It looks like to obey him completely. It looks like to to obey his word and his commands completely. To fear God is this, and it's on the screen, to hate sin. We have tolerated way too much sin in our life. It's to hate injustice. Some of us have been quiet too long about the injustice and, and not spoken up for those who don't have a voice. It's to, bar, to depart from evil in every sense. That means to flee, to run, to destroy, to eliminate, to cut ties with evil, to walk in authentic humility before God and man. Humility and fear are two sides of this, the same coin. Like you cannot be a humble person without first seeing Christ and seeing, wow, I am wretched to praise, adore, and thank him, to obey him eagerly, immediately, and completely, even when it doesn't make sense. There's times where God will tell me to do stuff, and I'm like, what? You want me to what? He's like, do it. Do it now. I'm like, okay. And sometimes it's evident why he asked me. In that moment, it's very evident why he asked me to do that. Oftentimes, I think it's just a test. He's like, can I trust you with looking silly for just a minute? Or can I trust you just in this moment? Because there's coming a day where I'm going to ask you to do something so radical. I'm going to ask you to write a check that is so big. I'm going to ask you to to give of your life or you're going to do something. But if I can't trust you to do something super simple, then how can I trust you with a big thing? Sometimes we're just waiting for God to direct our lives and say, God, just show me the next big step. And he's like, show me the next big step. You haven't even taken the first tiny step. Are we obeying him? And then obey him to completion, not just partially, to abstain from complaining and grumbling. Ask yourself, does this list on this screen, does it describe me? Does it describe who I am? In preparation for this sermon, I really felt like the Lord was wanting me to be firm in this, and this is a message that uh, has convicted my heart, but I want you to know that my heart is filled with love and, and not judgment towards anyone in this room. I, I'd rather gently say this, but this topic of fearing God and taking him and his word seriously is far too important. So please, 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 will you trust my heart this morning? I'm gonna do my best to not raise my tone so nobody feels like they're being yelled at. Pastor Weaver 20 years ago, okay, I'm, like, I, I, uh, I, I want you to receive this, but some of these words and these questions that I'm about ready to ask, you might feel the Holy Spirit of God pushing on your heart. That's not me. That's the Spirit of God. It's an invitation. Would you please receive it this morning? The first is this. Do you fear the Lord enough to be faithful with your finances? God is clear in scripture that we are to give 10% of everything that we earn to the Lord, of everything. Cash side hustles of everything. You say, oh, tithing's an Old Testament law, Pastor Austin. Wrong, wrong. Read scripture. Matthew five seventeen. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. If the Lord has spoken to you about your giving, you better give because you're robbing God if you don't. Trust God. And if you're fearful, there's not gonna be enough for me tomorrow. If you're fearful, that that is a perfect opportunity to say, God, I am trusting you with my finances. Listen, we need to surrender that fear to the cross. We need to surrender it. Second question is, do you fear the Lord with what you entertain yourself with? 
This might not be a popular take and people might get upset, but God is not pleased with watching any shows that have lewd language or coarse joking or contain and glorify sexual sins. You can hardly watch a cop's show or a, any, anything show without it just being full of innuendos and sexual content and getting your mind to think about, oh man, man, their, their marriage is so, oh man, that's, that's spicy, that's hot, that's this, that's that. If I came over and I went through your suggested show list or your movie list on your streaming app, would you be embarrassed to show me what shows are being suggested to you as your pastor? Think about this. You should be way more embarrassed because the Lord already knows it. He sees it. Some of you, the Lord has convicted you time and time again about what you are filling your mind with and your eyes with, yet you still haven't done anything. Fear God. Maybe you need to literally cut the cord. Maybe you need to save that, that $10 a month or, or $50 a month or $120 a month on, on whatever it is and say, God, I'm, I, I'm no longer going to entertain myself with things that displease you and break your heart, that, that actually affect the way that I interpret the world. Today is the day to change. Thirdly, do you prefer your family and what they think they need over God? Man, this is, this is a hard one. In the same chapter of our main scripture, Matthew chapter 10, a little bit further down in, in verse 37, Jesus says this, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whew. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This might be one of the most difficult passages in scripture. Is it wrong to love your children? No. But what happens when you love God more than anything else, you actually love your family better because you give your family what they need, not what you think they need or they say that they need. We've got to get that right, church. We've got to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Have you allowed your family to become an idol? Family is not bad, but when it comes before God, it is. Please don't be upset with me. These are the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Fourth, are you distracted with spending hours of day on your phone, your computer, or your TV? We just finished this last week, the 40 days of a digital fast. You know, my kids were over the moon to watch Over the Hedge on Thursday night or Friday night, right? They, they, were, they were excited. But can I tell you that those 40 days were great. There's a lot of things that I cut out. I'm not reintroducing. I realized, wow, life kept on going and it's going great. The good news, this is great news with finishing the 40-day digital fast, is I no longer carry the title Stupid Austin. <laughs> I'm just regular old Austin. Some of you have no idea what that is. You miss church on... On September 8th, but <laughs> you'll have to go back and watch Pastor Jeff's message. <laughs> but the fear of the Lord, hear me, with your phone, your computer, your TV, the fear of the Lord prevents you from just wasting your days away with fruitless distractions. When will you get serious enough about your relationship with the Lord and eliminate unnecessary distractions? Parents, this is a hard one. It's time that we prioritize church over sports. This is unpopular and it feels impossible, but that's exactly what Satan wants you to feel. That's exactly what he wants you to think, that there is no other option, that the only way your kid is gonna get playing time is by bowing to the, the idol of sports. Oh, come on, Pastor Austin. I, I don't think that letting my kids miss church for a season is gonna damn their souls. I think we've got too many parents thinking about how it will affect their kids and not enough parents praying about how it will affect their kids. If you sincerely pray about it and the Lord tells you that it's, it's okay to miss 10 Sundays a year, 20% of the Sundays for travel ball and everything else, then you go on and do that. But we need parents to start praying about what and how much our kids should be involved. And I pray that I'm wrong about this. I really do. 
I pray that in 15 years we've got a young generation that is more in love with Jesus than they are with football, soccer, dance, or anything else. I really honestly pray that I'm wrong about this. But I have a strong feeling and a a warning and an urgency from the Lord that if we continue to operate in, in just this mediocrity, lukewarm, just towards God, his mission, that he established a church and, and, and whatever we do um, today and compromises that we make, our kids are going to make in excess. Some of you, the Lord has asked you to stop drinking alcohol and you haven't. Ephesians 5.18 says, do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the spirit. I hate alcohol. I hate it so much. I talked with three different people this week that alcohol is literally ruining their lives, ruining marriages and families, and one of them almost to death. It's ruining their body. And that if they don't change, they might only have a month to live. I hate it. I wish that everybody wouldn't drink. This is what fearing the Lord would say. God, do you want alcohol to be a part of my life? Do you want my kids seeing me drinking a glass of wine at night and then obeying what the Lord tells you, not what Pastor Offison's preference is? You understand that? I'm not placing my conviction on you. I'm asking that the holy fear of God that you would go before the Lord and say, is this even something you'd want in my household? I just personally have seen it ruin too many people too many times. I'm not going to mess with it. Some of you, the Lord has convicted you of sin, yet you won't let go of it. If you've ever said the words, yeah, the Lord's been dealing with me about this the last year or so, that's a red flag. (laughs) If the Lord's been dealing with it, then deal with it. There might be someone deep into pornography and you've been feeling like you need to expose it and bring it to the light. Today's the day that you need to call a friend and say, I'm bringing you into my battle. You, you might be here and you're struggling with some form of an addiction or a substance. And today is the day that, that you need to repent and you need to bring people into that fight and have the honest uh, assessment of your life and your, of your mind to say, I need help and I need Jesus' help and I need others' help. Forgiveness. Oh boy. It's a process. Forgiving is a process. No. It's a decision. Jesus doesn't forgive us through a process. God, will you just forgive me of this sin? Huh, I just need to work through it, Austin. I, just, I just, need to, just need to emotionally get past this before I forgive you because it's a really big thing and it hurt me. Listen, forgiveness is a big issue. And, and I'm, these are not my words, but Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15 says, if you do not forgive others of their sins, your father will not give, forgive you of your sins. Those dealing with unforgiveness, scripture warns us that we can bust the gates of hell wide open by holding on to resentment. If the Lord's been dealing with it, deal with it. And he'll he'll direct you how to do it. Maybe you need to write a letter. Maybe you need to have a sit down and just say, I forgive you. Maybe you just every day, or you have that thought, just say, I'm not gonna think about that. I'm moving forward. I'm setting this down. I'm surrendering it at the foot of the cross. Hear me, if the Lord was knocking on your door about this or something that I didn't even bring up, please don't get mad at me about these things. Be grateful. Yes, yes, be grateful that the Lord is convicting you because it's God drawing you near to himself. He's wanting to cleanse you and set you free. Conviction is an invitation. I want to say that again. Conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is actually an invitation for God to say, I've exposed this sin. Would you repent and trust me to forgive it so that now I can be closer with you? If you're feeling a knock on your heart about something this morning, lean in. Don't run from God. Don't run from God. There's no shame. There's no guilt. That is God's grace in action. It's an invitation. So really quickly, because I'm running out of time. It's one thing to know that fearing God, what fearing God looks like, but you can intellectually understand something, yet not really believe it in your heart. Now don't laugh at me, but that's exactly where I'm at with exercising, (laughs) okay? Like, 
intellectually, I know it would be good for me. I'm not going to stand up here and argue with a doctor that going for a walk would be a good thing. (laughs) Never once. But for me, there's a slight disconnect between what I know and what I do. We can know what fearing the Lord looks like, but how do we learn to fear the Lord? How do we move from knowing that the fear of the Lord is good to actually fearing God? And I'll tell you how, and some of you aren't going to like this answer. If, if you want to grow in the fear of the Lord, you guys ready for this? If you really want to grow in fearing God, read your Bible more. Get to know who God is through his holy book. I'm not sure that I've ever met anyone who is in the word of God daily that doesn't fear God. This is a truth. It's on the screen. Holy fear grows proportionally to our comprehension of God's greatness. We should seek to increase our comprehension. This is done through reading God's word and spending time in prayer. As you get to know God, your level of holy fear will only increase. As you begin to see his perfection and his holiness, you'll just expose more and more of your imperfections and your wretchedness and your filth and your sin. As you see God, as you you learn about him, as you get to know his heart, it only highlights how desperate of a situation we are in. Some of you only know God through an emotion. You just know how, he fe- how you feel when you're around him. Uh, man, I'll tell you this. It could feel pretty exciting. Can you imagine Moses? Just, this isn't in my notes. God, give me the time and the grace to say this. Can you imagine Moses when the, the, the burning bush is taking place? And he saw that from afar. Could you imagine just like the Holy Spirit goosebumps and his, his you know, hairs are standing up on his neck and his arms and stuff and he's just kind of like near it. Like he could have just stayed there. But when he took a step closer, what happened? God is like, stop, not a step further. Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. I think sometimes there are Christians who know God by an emotion and they associate that with knowing God when in reality they just know how he makes them feel. But they don't really know how that makes them feel because they haven't really come in close. They haven't really heard his voice. They haven't really explored who he is. If your relationship with God is based on how he makes you feel, two things are almost guaranteed to happen. First, your life is not gonna see much change. You'll have these encounters that leave you feeling good, but then you'll just return to life as it was normal. And second, your relationship with God won't be very consistent and it will fizzle out because emotions come and go. We'll feel the Holy Spirit when we come to church, but then, man, I feel my flesh when I'm in the car with my husband on the way home. We have to know God, who he is. John Maxwell is one of the leading experts on leadership. And and one thing he talks about is how positional leadership is the lowest form of leadership. It bears the least amount of weight. Just because someone carries the title manager, it doesn't mean that people are going to follow them. Right? Positional is just the the least uh, uh, amount. People will only follow a title so far. He goes on to talk about how relational leadership is when you've won the respect of those around you by who you are and how you've impacted your organization and how you've impacted their personal life and you've helped others and eventually people will follow you because they've gotten to know you. If all you know God is by the position of his authority, it's not likely that you're going to follow him for long. We must spend time getting to know his heart and his mind so that we would follow him, not just out of position, but out of relationship. I have three kids. Here's a quick picture of them. Sam loves Star Wars, and we got a little millennial falcon waffle maker. Essie was a vibe. She's the one who is uh, flashing the peace sign. They're roller skating in our garage, which I'm not sure how safe that is. We've got a lot of objects and stuff, but um, Sam is a a blast right now. Uh, This week, I stayed home from from work on Wednesday and and Thursday. I wasn't feeling well, and I overheard this conversation of Elizabeth in the kitchen with with our kids, and uh, she was explaining what a man cold was. 
okay? <laughs> men, man colds really are worse, or worse, right? Can I get an amen? <laughs> All right, okay? And Sam goes, hey, wait, does that mean I get man colds or do I have to wait till puberty to get them? <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> I love my kids so much. These three kids, they're going to listen to me for a period of time simply because of my position and the title I hold as father. But if I want them to listen to me when they are teenagers and young adults, I better foster a relationship with them so they'll continue to follow me as I follow Christ. Obedience and the fear of the Lord hinges on getting to know the Lord. It's all about relationships. And as you learn to fear the Lord, it actually gets easier and easier because you'll begin to see more and more blessings as you follow God's ways. You'll see, wow, God's ways really are best. Wow, this really is. I really don't know what I'm doing. Would you just stand... And I'm going to ask, if you don't have anywhere to be, would you please stay here? Because I've, I've used a lot of words this morning, but right now is an opportunity to hear specifically for you and your situation and your life. God sees you and he wants to speak something. So would you just close your eyes and would you just pray this prayer with me? In fact, we'll just pray it out loud. Say, God, help me to hear your voice. Speak to me. I'm open. Would you change me? And I believe that the Lord is going to honor that pray, prayer. So right now, just for the next few moments, we're not in a hurry. This is literally the most important part of today is to hear God's voice. Ask the Lord to reveal what fears do I carry? Am I afraid of man's opinion towards me? Am I fearful for how we're going to pay the bills tomorrow? Am I fearful for my children? Then ask yourself this, do I, in the way that I live, do I truly fear God? God, would you speak to us this morning if there is anything that we need to lay at the foot of the cross in surrender, God, we do that. Just with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here today and you fear death, you fear death because you don't know who holds your tomorrow. You fear death because you're unsure that you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice on the cross. And you're afraid that if you were to die today or tomorrow that you would not spend eternity in heaven I believe that God wants to place his spirit inside you just as scripture says a spirit of power, love and sound mind a spirit that bears witness within our souls that we are saved, that we are sons, that we are daughters and so if you need to repent of your sins, which means to turn from them. It means to change the way you see things, to change your thinking and say, God, I'm sorry for the the way that I've lived my life. If you need to place your trust in Jesus Christ, which is demonstrated through obeying his word and say, God, I trust you that what you have done is enough for me. And you'd say, Jesus, save me today. I want to be in heaven with you forever. Just with every eye closed and head bowed, would you just slip up a hand and look at me? I just want to pray with you and for you. I see you in the back. Yes. I see you. 
Is there anyone else? I'd say yes. Yes, I see you over here to my right. God, I pray right now that a spirit of love would just wash over them, that the, the sin and the guilt and the shame and mistakes that happened maybe even last night or 15 years ago, I pray a covering of your blood that washes away those stains. And, and, and I pray, God, that today they would receive a spirit of purity, a, a, a sound mind, God, that you would allow them to think godly thoughts, that you would remove the shame. We tell Satan, who is the accused and the tempter and the shamer, we tell them to get, go away, to go back to hell, and we are tuning into your voice. So I pray, God, for those who have their hands raised this morning in accepting you. I pray that you would save them. I pray that you would deliver them, and I pray a peace would come over their hearts, that they would encounter you, not just intellectually, but every day, God. Help them set their feet on a path of righteousness. Give them a heart's desire to know you more through your word and through time and prayer, God. And I pray that every day that they would, they would tune into what you are saying, God, and not what the enemy has for them. Save them and forgive them all from what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.